Okay, welcome everyone to TAM Lab number 56. Today we are excited to have Jody Tyrus joining us. She's going to be moderating a panel of TAMs, uh, and we're calling this a Home Lab 101 Roundtable. So it's really going to be kind of uh, ask any questions you want around Home Labs, right? So the, the folks on the panel are all TAMs, um, and we all have a Home Lab to some extent, right? Some more uh, in depth than others, but uh, uh, it should be a good session. So. I will stop my sharing and I'm gonna hand it over to Jody and you can take it away. Thank you, Steve. Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our first panel uh, here at uh, TAM Lab. So it's a little bit uh, new for us. So be gentle with your uh, reviews at the end, be kind. Uh, and if you hear noises in the background of everybody, I, you know, I think you know, enough said that we're all working from home. Uh, some of us may have kids. Uh, There'll be no one naked running behind me or anything. Uh, maybe a cat might meow a little bit. But um, anyway, when I had talked to Steve about this, uh, I am not super technical, Tam. I don't have a Tam lab. When I worked at a customer, I had uh, hands-on access to, you know, huge consumer lab type thing. Uh, and as we've been going into these sessions, I've been really interested to, to understand, like, how hard is it for someone that doesn't have it? Like, how do you go from ground zero, you know, to at least a working lab? And there's been some sessions on that. And there's a ton of really great um, uh, documentation out there. So this isn't intended to be a technical 101, like, you know, what do I install first? What do I install second? How do I do X, Y, Z? So a little bit on the, like on the round table rules, we've got a great bunch of people here, as, as Steve mentioned, uh, they're all TAMs, uh, they have labs to different extents. And one of you know, the things that we'll go over at, at, when we introduce everybody is understanding um, you know, like what, what they have and how they started. Um, as I mentioned, um, there's a ton of stuff. We're not gonna try to squeeze it all in here, but one of the, one of the great resources, you know, William Lamb's site, Virtually Ghetto, he's got a whole section on TAM Labs uh, that will, can help people get started. Um, but before you even get into that, you know, there's some considerations that you might need to think about and who better to ask than people who already have um, labs that have been set up successfully. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get into the introductions of our, of our super TAMs here. Um, and what I want to do is, I, as I introduce you, uh, just give a, a brief uh, overview of who you are, where you are, and um, you know, kind of what your current lab setup is. So we'll start down the list with Steve. Sure. So yeah, Steve Tilkins. Uh, I am a TAM out of uh, Sacramento, California. I've been with VMware almost five years. It'll be five years in a in about another 20 days or something like that. So pretty crazy, it went by fast. Um, let's see, I guess I implemented my home lab uh, in June of 2017 was the first time I actually bought hardware. Prior to that, I was just doing you know, VMware Workstation or Fusion, things like that. Um, so it's been about three years, a little over, almost, almost three years now. Um, Let's see, what else, what else did you ask? Uh, kind of a, a brief bill of materials on your- Oh, on your yeah. yeah. Uh, so I started with uh, two HP ProLiant microserver Gen 8s, and I still have those today. Uh, they were limited to only 16 gigs of memory, so I couldn't do a whole lot with those, but that was like my first stepping stone, right? Just to kind of prove out the concept, like is there value here? Um, and then about a year later, I invested in two super micros uh, the, like the mini towers. So I'm doing a, a two node VCN cluster there. And then I use the HPs as kind of a, a small management cluster. Um, but yeah, so really just four hosts, four physical hosts, and then uh, all ubiquity networking equipment. So. Dean, Dean Lewis. Hi there. Um, yeah, so my name's Dean Lewis. I'm based in the UK. I've been working for VMware since December, 2000 and 18. Some days it feels like I've been here uh, longer. Some days it feels like I only started yesterday still. Um, so I've had, a, I've had various home labs um, for a number of years now. I actually started off, my home labs were Cisco based. So I think I bought my first Cisco routing and switching labs in about 2017, 18. Um, because I was uh, doing my Cisco certifications. So it was a really, really great way to kind of physically connect everything together, lab it all together, understand the technology inside out. And really the 
I put it down to passing my Cisco CCNA exams and CCMP exams through um, having that equipment. Um, and then as I moved to be more of a system administrator, I then started to buy servers and run servers at home as well. Um, my current lab bill materials, so I actually use some internal resources from VMware at the moment. My my physical servers at home are the Cisco um, C220 M3s, which are getting quite dated now. And I actually have um, some NetApp SANs as well, which are very, very power hungry. So when Matt um, did the previous TAM session, he covered some of that as well, which was, um, you know, how much is it going to cost you to run it? And it cost me a lot to run my home lab at the minute, so I don't. Uh, Sunny Wynn. Ah, hey Lou. Um, so I've only been with VMware for about 10, 11 months, but before that I've been with the customer for five months, uh, five years, and I've been a VAR, uh, with a VAR for another three years. And when I started with the VARs, I actually started building out my lab environment and it was where I could do everything, right? So I picked up um, two Dell um, racks, shoved them in the basement, I've got power edges down there. I've got um, a Clarion down there. Um, I've, it's been a while since I've turned those on just because it's just super loud and, and power hungry. But I spent a few K on all those pieces. And then I started building my own boxes because cause I, I thought, well, if I use less power and, and, and I use, you know, commodity hardware, I can get more bang out of, out of it. Um, and unlike Steve Token, I actually went the other way. So now I'm actually trying to shut most of that down and do mostly off of either Docker on my laptop or, um, you know, Fusion on my laptop to try to see if I can get everything running without, you know, turning on so much more stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm out of the uh, Boston area. No, thanks. Um, hey, Matt Craig, go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Yep. So I'm Matt Crape. I'm a TAM based out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, I've been with VMware. It'll be two years in July. So I guess about a year and three quarters. Uh, my home lab seems to just constantly be in a state of flux. Currently, it's uh, three Intel Nooks, sixth gen, one R720. I have an older T310, a, a FreeNAS Mini, and um, a bunch of ubiquity networking gear, much like Dean. I've also got you know stacks of some older Cisco gear that I used when I was studying for the uh, CCNA, but that stuff's largely sitting there unplugged at the moment. I think I see Ariel there next. Yep. Hi, Ariel Sanchez. I've been with VMware almost three years. I live in Orlando, Florida, right now. Uh, my first home lab was basically dual booting my gaming machine. And the main reason I started home labbing was that I wanted to be able to test things and make blog posts without, you know, having to do anything with the work infrastructure. Uh, my home lab journey has been really all about my wife doesn't like noise. So I've been very heavy into the Intel NOOCs. I have 14 hosts in the environment and uh, 11 or 10 of them are NOOCs today. So it was really cool when we figured out that they could take 64 gigs of RAM. That really helped. But yeah, that's my story so far. Uh, Dale McKay. Dale, can you hear us? Are you muted? I see him with a muted icon. Mm. Uh, we'll come back to him. Uh, Matthew. Hey, folks. Uh, Matt Mancini here. Uh, I'm out of uh, Northern uh, Arizona, been with VMware since uh, 2011. And, uh, and I, I can't honestly tell you how long I've been doing home labbing. <laughs> it probably started in the 90s, hooking up stuff as a consultant and moving into Cisco home labs and virtualization home labs and all types of stuff. Uh, so I've been doing it for quite a while, but um, my home lab is like porridge. <laughs> To be honest with you, right? And I think a lot of home labs are that way. It's like porridge. It's either it's too hot, it's not the right one, it's just right, you got it perfect, or it's kind of cold and it's evolving, right? So uh, home labs are like porridge. 
you kind of find your right mix that, that, uh, that works for you. What type of the forge that works for me doesn't work for you, but uh, you know, I've got a lot of different home labs. I, I mean, I spin up mining rigs and I, I like to tinker. I'm a tinker. I love putting things together and doing things that, that just aren't supposed to work. And sometimes I pay for that. <laughs> but uh, right now I've got uh, three hosts running that are all, uh, I built them myself. I went out and did all the research. I found all the products. I put all the pieces together. I love doing that. So I just build white box home labs. I do it again and again and again. I probably have six of them here. Three of them are running. Three of them are not. And I just evolve them over time. A lot of that stuff you're interested in. A lot of the more finer details that fall out on my blog, you can read it out there. Uh, Matt Strait, or I'm sorry, James Strait. Hey guys, um, Jim Strait with been with VMware for about four and a half years, based out of Minneapolis. And kind of like Matt, my home lab uh, has been around since the Novell 312 days. So yeah, it's been an evolution uh, for 20 some years, right? Uh, currently it's, I typically do white boxes or, or used, uh, used gear, used equipment. Uh, currently I've got a couple Lenovo TS 140s and uh, uh, a DL380, uh, a G7. Um, so I, I don't know that I'll be able to get uh, vSphere 7 running on it, but that's a, that's another conversation. Uh, but, sure not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I use it for learning, learning different products, uh, testing upgrades. Uh, and one of the other things I do with it is I mimic up um, kind of typically uh, every one of my customers environments, the version of vSphere that they're running and the version of NSX that they're running. And then I can, when they have questions, I can, uh, I know exactly the screens that they're looking at. Uh, we can test things with my customers through my home lab as well, so. Thanks. Uh, Nico, introduce yourself. Hey everyone, um, thank you. My name is Nico Guerrera. Uh, I am based in Connecticut, uh, dedicated enterprise TAM. I started with home labs to host gaming servers for me and my friends um, because back in the day, cloud servers just weren't a thing back around 2010. So I started with, with um, you know, a white box of my old PC parts, like most people do, um, ran just free ESX on it. Uh, and then as I became a VMware admin, I kind of started to um, peruse eBay. Uh, I'm the king of finding used stuff for cheap. I don't buy anything new for the home lab. Um, and I do swap it out because I get bored quickly. So um, my home lab is also in the middle of a transition. I have an HP DL360 Gen 7, which won't support um, vSphere 7. Uh, so I just ordered an IBM a Lenovo ThinkStation C30, which is kind of like a tower server. It's a dual, dual socket with, I think, 256 gigs of RAM in it used off of eBay. So that's kind of going to be my, my one-stop shop for all labbing. And, you know, I, I used to have... Um, three or four servers and then like a free NAS and all this other stuff and having all those power supplies plugged in, it, it drove me crazy power bill wise. So now I kind of, am just a fan of having everything in one box. I have all the SSDs in that one box and I kind of do everything nested. Um, so I have Kubernetes nested, I have vSAN nested, I have everything nested. And then being a TAM tech lead, it's super helpful because when you talk to a customer, um, you know, if I want to do login site, if I want to do VROPS, I have it all available, ready to run and everything's integrated. So, um, and having it in one machine just makes it easy to like carry around if I need to, or kind of diagnose if I need to. So um, yeah, start, started with uh, game servers and ended with kind of just the entire environment just to do uh, demos and things like that. Cool. Uh, Dale, what you want? we'll try you again. Hey, I think I got it this time. Uh, my name is Dale McKay. I'm a senior TAM, uh, kind of in a period of transition, moving out of uh, an enterprise TAM role into a security lead role on the network and security technical account manager team. So pretty excited about that move. My home lab has been around for over 10 years. It took me through my Cisco certifications, like Dean mentioned, it also took me through my Microsoft certifications. Um, and now has taken me quite a ways into uh, the usage of VMware and taken me through the VMware certs. Um, I run multiple SDDCs on three physical hosts. 
So my biggest uh, advice to people just starting this out is to embrace nesting right off the bat. I, uh, it took me a while to get to that point, but once you get to that point, uh, the capacity of your home lab is dramatically increased, allowing you to do things like I just mentioned. Um, so that would be my advice to you guys. Thank you. And Bill. Awesome. Hey, everybody. So uh, my name is Bill, uh, Tam out of Portland. Uh, my home lab uh, is um, transitioning right now. I, I started off, I've been with VMware for three years, and so my lab has really started off as workstation, um, trying to leverage the, the awesome uh, Dell laptop that I have. Um, and so I've been pretty successful with that, but I just recently started ex you know, building out, a, we'll call it a little more proper, roll your own style leveraging um, uh, Ryzen as the processor. Right. And so going the AMD route on that guy. Um, so I finished, uh, I have one host up now, uh, just putting it through some final paces and then I'll likely be expanding that to at least three to st support things like vSAN and then, you know, see where it goes from there. Cool. And I think last but not least, Kevin Motes. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Motes. I'm a networking and security TAM based out of Columbus, Ohio. And I've had some sort of iteration of a home lab for the last 20 years, everything from running, you know, uh, ESXi, uh, or not even I, ESX 2.0 on old Pentium 3 G1 uh, HP servers. Uh, and it's this constant battle of basically, you know, having enough capacity to test the things you need to test for your customers, but still trying to buy hardware, you know, that's fairly inexpensive, that'll just barely do the job for you. Uh, about six years ago, my home lab actually became much more production. Uh, I'm a wireless ISP in my neighborhood. I'm out in the sticks. <laughs> and nobody can get internet in the area. So I've got an FCC license and a backhaul to my house and I redistribute to four other people. So that actually runs on the production portion of my home lab. And then I've got kind of the whole play portion that I use um, to uh, test things for customers. Um, the bare bones um, you know, production portion is actually a simple shuttle DS81 running two virtual machines, a Sophos UTM uh, firewall and uh, a Linux box that then manages that whole Wi-Fi. Uh, for all of my customers. And then uh, beyond that, I've got a couple Atom-based machines that are very low power that run kind of my core NSX, my core virtual center server, and like the physical assets. And then under that, I've got two HP Z620 boxes with 128 gigs of RAM each that I do my nesting and test everything uh, for uh, my VMware customers on. So. Good. You know, there's, you know, you know, thank you for those introductions, guys. Um, you know, there's, there's been a couple of times that I've picked up things about noise and power and cost. You know, that seems to be like the, the biggest kind of, you know, uh, hurdle to overcome, at least at the beginning and maybe even ongoing as you look at how much does it cost to run my lab? Um, is my spouse getting mad because I'm, it's, it's too loud or, you know, uh, you know, the power consumption is, is putting a dent in the household budget. Um, how do you decide, you know, not everyone needs to jump in, but how do you decide what your limit is like for your home lab is, you know, does anyone have like, okay, I, I'm not going to spend more than $50 a month uh, for power for this thing, for this sucker. Um, and I, I'm going to put a little bit of, you know, some constraints around how much I'm going to spend. Anybody? Sure. One of the things noise is pretty big for me. Uh, so one of the things that I look for is like a desktop, type of a unit, something that's got bigger fans in it versus a 1U kind of a server that has tiny fans that have to spin real fast, you know, so those boxes are a little bit quieter. Um, and my my largest server has the, the low power Xeon processors in it. So um, I'm able to have the cores and the CPU power, but I specifically looked for chips that were low power chips in order to keep my, my power costs down. And all of my gear, I've got four servers running and all my gear runs me about $25 a month in electricity and is quiet. It's like 68 decibels. So it's like a conversation. Now, where do you, where do you physically store that, that equipment at? Is it in a closet somewhere? Or it's in a, yeah, it's in a utility room in my basement. So it's not right next to um, like the family room or anything like that, but it's pretty quiet. In my case, I've been in apartments all, all my life and my home lab right now is right next to my wife's desk. So it has to be quiet. <laughs> I, 
you know, the, the question of how much you set as a, as a limit, you're always going to go over it at some point. And uh, you just, my, my approach has been taking little by little as I need it. Uh, making sure, like Nico said, to make, make sure you get bargains. I always try to get my stuff secondhand. Or even I've had people just tell me, hey, I'm not using this anymore. Here you go. And it's like, ooh. So you, you really can't. If, if you put, if you're building your own first, your first host, like Steve Tilkins did with the Spur Micros, those things to get them properly built, it's like $2,000. So that could be your first year. But after that, you will keep adding to it little by little as time goes and you need it. Yeah, I'm a big fan of buying used equipment and trying to keep it as quiet as possible. Mine is in the basement, um, but I try to keep mine under maybe forty, fifty dollars a month power consumption. Um, and I find that the, you know, workstation, professional workstations seem to be um, pretty decent, low power, but you know, server class, uh, you know, accept a lot of RAM. So that's where the Z620s. But I think I'm gonna have to upgrade here soon. I think they're just barely on the compatibility list for 7.0. Yeah, one thing I would mention is the fact and several of the panelists have mentioned about buying used stuff off of eBay. You need to get pretty good at doing that. There's also a couple of uh, Reddit uh, subgroups that you might want to join. Uh, one of them is called Home Lab Sales. Uh, interestingly enough, there's also another one called Hardware Swap. Uh, I can put them in the chat, but that's another good place to get good used hardware. You shouldn't be afraid of buying used hardware because at the end of the day, you're the one that's supporting this anyway. Um, so I, I haven't, I might've gotten burned on a couple of drive purchases on eBay, but other than that, I've been really super successful and I bought servers, Synology boxes, networking gear, all of that has come off of eBay. So um, in the UK, it's a little bit harder. Um, a lot of the Reddit forums are mentioned are um, kind of US centric. But um, in the UK, we, we still have kind of like um, serverfactory.co.uk and bargain hardware, I think it's called .co.uk. Uh, yes, I've just seen that I've actually got a, a sticker from them um, where you can buy kind of really cheap or bundle deals, which is quite good. Um, where Ariel mentioned starting off small and growing, um, I'm kind of on the opposite side, depending on what you need to use your home lab for. So I've got a few friends at the moment that I've really looked at their home lab and said, okay, I need a home lab so I can replicate a small version of a customer or demo a few different uh, solutions such as NSX, Horizon. So then what they've done is they've um, bought a handful of super micros, maybe two, Build them full of memory. The Super Micro um, E300 boxes are very, very low power, very, very quiet. And they've kind of put some, uh, you know, a good amount of money into that up front, but they know that they're going to use them for the next two or three years and the investment's going to pay off. For me personally at home, um, one of the things that I made sure I invested in is I have a Synology um, 8 bay NAS box and I use the enterprise disks in there because half of that storage is used for my home lab and half of that storage is actually used for my own personal files and so forth. So I really don't want to be supporting my file storage at home. I just want something to consume that works. And it's almost enterprise grade. So it's really worth the investment from that side of it. Yeah, I agree. You know, one of the, one of the things that... Moved to a Synology as well, and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, but I also just did find another project called XPE Ology that is um, where you can take the Synology operating system and load it in virtual machines and on bare metal too. So. Cool. Um, Starting to play with that as well. Yeah, I yeah. think one of the things to think about before you, before the folks listening to this call, is don't go out and buy stuff. <laughs> We're all talking about products here, but the first thing you should do is have a plan of what you're going to do before you go out and start buying things, right? Yeah. And use what you have. But don't be afraid. You don't have to go out and buy a Synology. You don't have to go out and buy a Super Micro. You might have that PC or laptop sitting on your desk that is a perfectly good starting point to start your home lab and plan it out. Think about what you want to do, draw it out, explain it simply. If you can do those things, then start looking at maybe expanding it and making your building blocks and moving it on. But avoid buying first. <laughs> You're going to waste money if you do, do it that way. Yeah, point, I, just, Matt. I just want to echo what Matt's saying, and I think it actually – there's another step that you need to add in there. You need to figure out what you're going to use your home lab for. You heard Jim mention that he likes to mimic his customer environment. I do the same thing. You may want to 
use it in a much more cyclic fashion, install the latest and greatest and then blow it away and then start again. It, that's something that you need to determine because you can't always emulate what your customer has and be doing this fast cycle, loading up all the latest software in that one same environment. This is where the whole conversation about nesting comes in because you could do it in the nested environment. So that's, I think that's super crucial that you understand exactly what it is you're going to use that lab for. And so you mentioned talk- that you, um, uh, use it to replicate your, your customer environment. Do you, do you let your customers jump on there or is it just kind of your own cloistered little environment? No, it's I kinda, use it. I use it for, oh, go ahead, Jim. Oh, I was going to say, um, I don't let my customers really jump onto it. I, I build it up for my own purpose. Um, but we have, you know, I have done Zoom sessions with them where uh, we can go through and step through a process on my home lab first before trying it in their environment. Um, so to, I think you you do something similar too. I think I've seen you give, well, outside of like running the TAM lab stuff as well, but uh, I think I've seen you give a demo uh, for your customer before. Yeah, I mean, it's something I do all the time. In fact, um, I mean, I guess I've said it before, right? But when you start working at VMware, it takes probably two years before you're comfortable just because there's so much being thrown at you, right? Just learning everything internal at VMware, which is overwhelming, learning about your customers, uh, and then all the products that we have, which is overwhelming. Like when I started, I was like, oh, it's vSphere. <laughs> We've got so many products, we keep acquiring more every day. So it's hard to keep up with that. Um, so it takes about a year to two years where you start getting comfortable. And uh, that's when I pulled the trigger on the home lab. In fact, I'll show took a quick screenshot or a, a picture of what it looks like just to give you an idea. So if you can see that, that's right above me on the top of my desk. So it has like a, uh, my desk has like a bookshelf uh, top portion of it. So I put it up there. It's pretty quiet. Like it just sounds like a desktop. Uh, it does get warm though in the summer for sure. So I uh, just thought people would like to see kind of what what it looks like, right? But you can see the two HPs there on the left. Those are my, my first ones that I actually bought from a customer uh, who's a good friend of mine and then uh, bought the Super Micros later. And they've got a lot more horsepower. They each have 128 gigs of memory. Um, and I just upgraded those to seven here. So uh, yeah, it's it's been really good. And as far as uh, demoing it, right? I use it all the time. My customers are trying to do certain things like, hey, how do you do this? And I'm like, you know, I have an idea of how to do it, but I don't know exactly how to do it. Give me a couple hours, I'll do it in my lab, and then we'll walk through it together, right? So it's it's been invaluable in that perspective. So it's, uh, Sunny, um, got a question for you, and, sure. and maybe after you answer, we can we can let some other people uh, jump in too. What? don't you have in your lab that you wish you did? And I'm not talking about hardware. I mean, cause I, you know, I think we all want more hardware, uh, but if there was something in your, in your lab that you could have that you don't right now, what would it be? To be honest with you, it, 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 it always comes down for me. It always comes down to RAM, right? Cause, cause in the past I, I've done exactly how you guys did it, which was, I bought a lot of used hardware. They were awesome, but, but then I find myself always fixing it all the time. So then I start building my own boxes and, and that helped me, right? And, and I cheated because I would build fewer boxes, but I would actually have hot swappable drives so I can run Windows, I can run Linux, I can run VMware, and, and it's still the same boxes, right? The problem I always come across is, is, is the cost of RAM is always a killer for me, you know? So, so I always have to slim down all of my installs and try to figure out how to make things work. I can never mimic my customer because because their 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 scale is so much higher, but that's what stops me from the current stacks. So so you guys know when you're trying to run um, PCF or when you try to run NSX with vCenter with ESX, it it just requires a lot more RAM because all of the VMs are are just so big. So so that's that's currently my 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 downfall at the moment. So I find myself always figuring out how to get more stuff. One thing I wish I was running, and I tried for a week to get it to run, 
is Pivotal Cloud Foundry with NSX. Um, it was a complete disaster. Like, I don't, I don't know how people do it in production, but I, I deployed a PFSense router and I created VLANs and I created all this great stuff. And I ran through the install. And every time you would get through this install, there'd be like a massive error that was like seven pages long. You'd have to copy and paste and like put it in another text. And it wouldn't even tell you what's wrong. So like I got through, I, you know, I spent about one day, I would get like a little further and a little further. And I think after about a week of me just constantly trying to get PCF deployed and all the, the different components and all the different VLANs, like I had to give up. Like I just couldn't do it anymore, like without actual support. And I understand that's a very complicated product, but that probably tested the limits of my abilities and I just wasn't able to get it deployed. But I would love to have it deployed because my customer uses it and it's, you know, pretty popular um, software. We have a, a question or a comment from uh, Zachary Johnson uh, to the panel, and he you know talks about you know what works versus what's supported. You know, some servers um, will work with more installed memory than advertised. Uh, you know, how do you guys feel about that, uh, or what, what are your, some of your your comments or experience with you know if it's hardware is not on the on the hardware compatibility list, um, but it, it'll still work, um, but you know, if you run that for long enough, you may hit a, a wall at, at some point where you've got to do some cleanup. So my comment on that is um, Google it. I've been very surprised at how forgiving ESX is with uh, white box stuff. Um, I've never hit anything where, um, except for a few maybe, you know, wireless cards or network cards that even somebody would make drivers for in ESX that you can just load in. So, um, you know, if you're going to buy a white box machine on eBay, if you're going to buy some kind of um, uh, tower server or any kind of rack mount, just uh, go on Google and you know Google to see if anyone else has used it. Go to Reddit or either in the VMware or the Home Lab sections, and there's a lot of people you can ask there. And so you know if, if you need to Google a certain SATA controller or a 10 gig uh, card, literally put in the model number in ESX. And nine times out of 10, someone on Google will say, yeah, I use that and it works fine. Or here are the caveats that you have to look out for. So the HCL is a good place to start, but then just, you know, the internet in general and finding other home lab enthusiasts is also a very good way to go to find out if something works. And I yeah, would echo the interrupt for a, for a second and, and clarify the, the question. I, I was trying to trigger a conversation. So um, servers often will support more installed memory than what is advertised. That kind of thing has nothing to do with whether or not it'll be compatible with vSphere. And in my view, those are the kinds of things that if you discover it's possible is to your advantage. Whereas deviating from what's supported according to VMware's HCL is uh, to the point just made, not always bad, but is something to be cautious about. Mm -hmm. so, so in my personal opinion, if you're running lab gear that's on the HCL, you're probably paying too much. So I don't think anything I have is on the HCL or officially supported. So supported and works is completely two different things. The HP Z620s that I mentioned are technically only supposed to support 64 gigs of RAM, but they will take the 16 gig sticks and they work just fine. Yeah, um, and, and the Gen 2 will actually take 32 that, gigs. Yeah, I got some 10 gig cards that just barely work. And there was even a thread running around uh, internal to VMware this morning talking about how 7.0, if you've got a, a CPU that's not supported, you could load the USB stick in a workstation or in a different machine and literally just pull it out and shove it in an older style um, CPU uh, machine that's not supported and it seems to be working just fine for people. So there's a lot of workarounds out there. So I, I ran into both those situations that Zach mentioned uh, with the NUX, the sixth gen, gen NUX. Again, William Lamb is probably the alpha in the community in finding out this stuff and, and communicating it. But you know, finding out that you could take those chipsets up to 64 gigs of RAM with the right uh, DIMMs, that also happens to work with my Dell laptop that VMware provided. I'm running 64 gigs on it right now, not documented anywhere. It just runs and it's a stable. So we really are, you know, pushing and finding out for yourself and then commenting with others. It, it really is a community effort to find out when, when things can run a bit more. And then the other part. No, the other part is uh, when you're running something that you know is not supported, like running vSentinel Flash on Nooks, I mean, you, you just have to try the best you can. So what I've done there is the capacity drives are actual, you know, Intel SSDs, data center level SSDs. So at least I know those guys can take some of that, you know, advanced um, load that VSEN will put on them. The M2 drives, I just, I'm not going to pay enterprise M2 drives. I'm just going to use whatever it is, but that's cash. So you're, you're kind of trying to figure out what's really important and what you should spend more money on. 
I think it, you know, great, great points. And it, a lot of this just comes down again to tolerance and balance. Like I made that porridge condiment earlier, right? <laughs> if you really like to do what Zach is talking about and putting things in that aren't supposed to work, but do, right? You've got a high tolerance to do that versus you're the type of person who just wants to mess with the software and get going and just buy servers that are going to work and I'm going to follow the guidelines perfectly. There's a couple different home labbers there. And it, again, it goes back to what is your tolerance level? What, what type of porridge do you like? <laughs> right? I don't mind it too hot. Some might like it cold and it depends on what you want to accomplish. And it goes back to having a good plan. This, a lot of this all goes back to having that initial plan, a good solid plan moving forward and then adapting that plan as you go. Um, biggest mistakes, um, Matt, uh, Matt Crape, uh, what's the biggest mistake that you've made with your, uh, uh, your home lab so far? Probably not treating it enough like production. And what I mean by that is I don't document it nearly as well as I should, right? Whether it's uh, passwords for appliances, IP addresses, stuff like that. You know, I'm not necessarily always on top of my backups, you know, um, and when something goes wrong, <laughs> I always think, boy, I really wish I took a proper backup of this versus spending all this time rebuilding it because I already know how to rebuild it because I'm bad at taking backups. It's very cyclical with that manager in that uh, manner. And, you know, just similarly, you know, even keeping current, you know, it, it's one thing to, you know, always wanting to be running the latest and the greatest. On the flip side, it's also too easy to fall so far behind. Then you get demotivated saying, oh, I have to go through like this four-step upgrade. You know, do I just blow the way? Do I go through the process? Um, so, I mean, in a nutshell, I, I, you know, not treating it like production enough. Nico, how about you um, as far as uh, either biggest mistake or things that you wish you hadn't, hadn't done? I wish I hadn't buy that HP DL360 because while it had a ton of RAM and I was running really low on RAM, um, it seems to only totally accept enterprise SSDs or enterprise drives or else I get IO errors and it's not going to be supporting, you know, vSphere 7 without doing some, you know, USB plugging. So I spent like $300 on the thing thinking it was going to, I could just ignore the warnings and just go on, but you can't always do that. So you really have to be careful uh, if you're going to buy something, whether or not, you know, it's not compatible, that's fine, but is it going to give you issues? So, you know, now I have a server I have to replace that isn't going to be able to run the newest version of vSphere. And if I put certain drives in certain bays, uh, the whole system crashes. I have to pay a license for the HP ILO. Like, so, you know, I have to keep asking for um, trial keys from HP. So it's been more headache than it's worth. So I think um, I would probably just go back to white boxes and things like that and just, I don't know, leave that server sitting in my basement or use it for, for something else. Bill, how about you? Yeah, I think, you know, my, my home lab right now, primarily being my work laptop, it's, it's kind of this, you know, forgetting the balance of the fact that this is a machine that I use for work as well as lab. And so managing resources, um, you know, overloading, you know, a virtual ESX host that I have running on it, um, and then start seeing these, you know, weird impacts later on, or, you know, forgetting to properly shut everything down. And then next thing you know, uh, my laptop went to sleep right, overnight, things like that, right? So they all have unintended uh, impacts to what I'm expecting to happen in that virtual environment. Um, you know, for example, running uh, the, the home lab, or sorry, the TAM lab with uh, what, what I call it, fun with PSCs and vCenters, the amount of times that I screwed that up um, prior to the lab just because it fell asleep or I was doing something and I just completely overloaded it. So, you know, when you are using workstation or fusion you just have to be extra careful on how you manage your resources um, and understand there could be some impacts that you may not see yet now one of the things i've, I've you know especially in the last couple of weeks uh, that i've noticed uh, uh you know virtually say virtualization teams at, at, at my customer you know they were you know purely vSphere, vrops vra um some nsx vsan um and Horizon and all the other stuff was kind of like the desktop people just go away and if we decide to do that and the whole world has kind of changed overnight um, and 
we had you know the teams some of the teams that I work with are are are, are trying to now set up horizon environments has has anyone done anything different in the last month or so with your lab to kind of reflect what you're seeing out there um, let's go I, I don't know who wants to speak first for that I, I can speak to that yeah I I've traditionally never been real strong with Horizon, Workspace One, any of that. And then the last month, uh, I've got most of the components up and running in my lab. And it's not set up to best practices by any means, but it's enough to where I can at least have an understanding of how it all works, right? Um, so yeah, I've, it's nice having the capacity in the lab there when I need it to do things like that, right? So, Has anyone um, else stood up Horizon recently? So, um, so my background is actually Horizon, um, but one of the things I call out for that as well is where you're not quite sure about some of those components that you want to run in your home lab, the VMware hands-on labs is a great place to quickly spin up an environment, check it out, check what's needed, see if it worked in the way that you expected before you then choose to deploy it in your home lab as well. So I used to do that quite a lot when my home lab was quite a lot smaller and I wasn't working for VMware. Yeah, great plug for hands-on labs, and that's another alternative to home labs. Um, so for those that aren't aware, the hands-on labs environments, most of them are complete environments with, you know, Horizon and vSphere and NSX and all this stuff already deployed for you, and you don't necessarily have to follow the manual. So if you've got a customer that's trying to do something in their production environment, if you find a hands-on lab that has the components installed, you can launch that lab and go in and do whatever you want inside that lab. You don't necessarily have to follow the manual. Uh, so you can go in and you can take screenshots and you can provide those to your customer and say, here's how you go configure, you know, this particular, um, you know, component or this feature that you're looking for. But it should be noted, it's not persistent. It's persistent. Right. We'll right. go away in for eight hours and that's it. Right. Not persistent. Yeah, the other concern about the home lab, um, the uh, um, hands-on lab is that you can't go into the, for example, you know, connect into the vCenter and take a look in, underneath that. Or, or VRA and stuff like that. So I find that as as I try to leverage more of the resources that we built out in our home lab, there are a lot more things inside that that I can start tweaking and understanding more of that that hands-on lab does not have. That's the only gotcha. Sure, and I'm not saying that it's a replacement for a home lab. I obviously maintain a home lab, but I use my home lab also to help development with hands-on labs. I'm a fourth, fifth year captain now, I think, and um, currently playing with the NSX intelligence appliance to see how small I can make it to see whether or not we're going to actually be able to introduce it into the hands-on labs this year. So that's another thing that I use my home lab for. Yeah, the uh, hands-on labs are great for those what-if questions. Like what happens if you take this host out of a vSAN cluster? How does that work, right? It's, it's great for those, like it could completely break everything. And I don't want to break my home lab necessarily. So I still use it for those sorts of scenarios. Um, one thing, uh, I guess it was a couple of questions ago, Jody, but uh, one of the things you regret, right, or wish you had done differently. Um, it's, it's an interesting question because I don't see like anything I've done in my home lab. I've blown it up. I can't even tell you countless times, right? But I still don't think that that's something I regret because I've learned something every time I've done that, right? Um, I guess my biggest regret, though, is really not doing the home lab sooner, right? Mm -hmm. I, I should have pull the trigger on that because it's no matter what amount of money I've spent on it, it's fully justified. And I do write that off on taxes too, by the way. <laughs> I, I think someone in one of the comments uh, had, had brought that up about uh, uh, writing, writing, you know, kind of that investment off on taxes. Does, is anyone here um, have like a, uh, an entity that they've done, you know, to, to help with that or just all as yourselves? Mine's linked. So the way that I'm able to do that is I have a requirement, a, custom, a customer requirement to prove out things, right? And I can't run, I can't read, they trust me enough to run what I need to do in my home lab, but not enough to put it into VMware infrastructure because there's some IT there, right? So I have a, a trust, basically a trust agreement with them to do that. So because it's a requirement of my job, I'm able to justify that and make it, it justified. The, the, the expense I put in is justified for those reasons. It's a requirement of the job. So I'm not a tax advisor, though. <laughs> <laughs> so check with your CPA and your accountant on that one, but uh, until I get away with it. 
Um, we had a, a question here uh, from one of the anonymous attendees about uh, you know getting bogged down in the building and maintaining versus actually being able to you know like, you know test new features or or, or, or learn new new things and, and products. Um, what's your guys' experience with that, uh, Dale? Yeah. Or I don't know who. who a big panel. Oh, yeah, I was actually just typing an answer to that question. And I think it's very, for me, it's very cyclic. Like I'll have periods of time where I'm building infrastructure and then I'll have periods of time where that infrastructure is very solid and I'm busy loading new software, testing new things on the software. So I think it is pretty cyclic. I'm, lately, uh, for me, it has tended to be more about testing new software than building new infrastructure, but then I just went through a full refresh on my home lab over the past six or eight months. So that's probably why I'm at the testing. Yeah, I was just kind of responding to that question as well. Um, I like to update like vSphere and ESXi, you know, pretty much right away. I like to just be on the latest, greatest versions all the time uh, from that perspective. Um, but most of my environment is all nested, right? We've kind of talked about some of the nested stuff and I've built that out a hundred times before, like many other people have done. And so I automate that. I, that's all scripted. And so when I build up my little customer environments, each one of those customer environments is a little nested one. And I don't build it out to the full scale that they are. I just build a couple of hosts with the same version uh, that they're running and just enough to, to just kind of mimic it up, right? And in a way to reduce the amount of time I'm maintaining my infrastructure, that's all scripted. I've wrote some scripts on it and boom, I kick it off and I can have an entire environment built automatically within about a half an hour. Yeah, it's I another advantage it, of doing things nested. Yeah, don't, don't forget that DLC is a good way to script some things too. And that actually comes with a little bit of support. The BCF lab constructor, if you're just wanting to spin up an SDDC, that's a great way to do it. Depending upon your hardware, it might take you about three hours to go from nothing to a complete SDDC with NSXV um, installed and configured the whole bit. You know, I think it's like uh, it's like going to the junkyard, right? <laughs> Are you the type of person that likes to go to the junkyard and pull out an axle, a Dana 44, and stick it on your Jeep, right? Are you the type of person who likes to go to eBay and find that card that everybody is throwing away and not using it and like to stick it in your in your system? What type of person are you? What do you want to do? Right? This is your plan again. Do you want to build it your own and go to the junkyard and pull things together like no one's ever done before? You're probably going to have some maintenance. You're going to learn a ton, right? And you're going to invest a lot of time doing that. Or are you the type of person that needs to go and buy or, you know, Dell servers that are on the HDL and have a support contract and when it breaks, you can call someone, like a contract on your car, brand new vehicle, right? What type of person are you? And that, that really, it comes down to that, those decisions you make, right? Yeah, and I was just thinking about that. You know, it's like for me, I, I don't like to sweat and get dirty. And so mm -hmm. I want a, a home lab in a box. Like, you right. know, where can I, you know, is there someone that's building that that can just say, ship it to me and say, stick this in the corner, connect to it, and then do this configuration, then play around with it. You know, that'd be great for someone like me that just doesn't want to go through the effort of getting through that initial setup. It's like, I want to, I want to make it easy button, you know, you know, for someone like me, but then I want to play around with the actual software and, 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 be, and learn it and be able to support my customer better. Um, and, and I, I'm also on the, if it costs a little bit more, I'm okay with that. Um, right. So your porridge, your porridge is different than my porridge, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm the cold locks where it has to be like perfect. Right. You know, you know, I like to put a little sriracha sauce in mine, get nice and spicy, right? Yeah. So, for me, right? Um, when I was building the the boxes in the racks, it, it was very time consuming. I find that that I'm building, rebuilding more often than I'm I'm playing with the new features. That's why earlier on you meant, you've heard me mentioning I'm trying to do a lot more on my laptop. Right, because cause, cause with Fusion, I can actually install so many variations, save off that disk to my external drive. And then the only thing I need to do left is just bring it back in and out. it's back on, it's up and running. When I started doing uh, Docker's and Kubernetes the same way, how can I 
build those things out fast, save off to config. So I don't have to save a lot of disk, but yet still get a lot of things up and running, you know? So, so that way I, I worry about the, the new features, the new configurations instead of always reinstalling and then and, and reconfiguring. Um, now, how many, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Joe. Yeah. Um, so I think for me that keep it simple to begin with, especially if you're starting out with your home log to begin with, keep your networking simple. You know, if you need an active directory server with DNS, just, just deploy one virtual machine, make a backup of it. So for example, Veeam, um, if you've got a VCP, a VCAP, you're a V expert, um, you know, they, they hand out uh, not for resale keys. Um, so go and get a, a backup key off them so you can back up the, uh, your virtual machine. But keep the networking simple. So earlier this year, I was doing a lot of work with VROPs. So I had a single host running in my home lab connected to my storage. I'd have vCenter deployed. I'd have a VROPs instance. I'd deploy a handful of small Linux virtual machines to produce some traffic because I was concentrating on um, building VROPs dashboards and testing VROPs configurations so that I could then build that with my customer again. So I didn't need three or four VLAN set up. I didn't need to be using multiple subnets for all of that. So I didn't need to make things complex up front. Um, and that really helped because going back to one of the questions that was asked about how do you manage the complexity? I, I made sure it wasn't complex to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, how many of you, you know, you got labs, I, you know, I see, I see your guys' names, you're on Twitter. How many of you uh, are also blogging about what you're doing in your, in your home labs? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. All the learners. Great. Great. We'll have to, uh, when we put this out, we'll have to include some of those uh, blog links uh, and some of the other resources uh, so that people can, can kind of get to it. Cause like I said, it's a huge topic and we're not trying to obviously, you know, you know, build a lab online while you are doing it or, or tell you everything you need to know. Um, but as we close up on kind of the top of the hour, um, let's, let's go through and, and I'll start with Dean. Um, last kind of last thoughts on home labs. Um, so again, keep it simple. Um, do a quick Google for virtualg.uk um, and then append DNS and NTP to that. Great blog post on how to use Photon OS, which is a lightweight Linux instance, to use it for your DNS and your NTP within your lab. Sometimes you don't actually need a full Active Directory. So keep it simple. Keep it small where needed. Matthew, Matt. Yeah, I think the uh, last thoughts on it is, uh, like, like you've heard me start from the beginning to the end, is figure out what your Goldilocks zone is, right? And uh, figure out what your tolerance is and have a plan. And the way I look at it is when you start having your plan, if you can explain it simply to somebody else, you're ready to make that next step. So that'd be my advice. Uh, Jim, hold on. Yeah, kind of similar advice to Matt. Um, have an understanding of what you're trying to do with the lab and uh, keep it simple. Um, and don't be afraid to, to buy used gear. It doesn't always have to be on an HCL and, and you can save a lot of money doing that. Ariel, last thoughts. So everybody else has said good things, but what I, what I will say is that if you see somebody that has kit that you're, you're assuming or, or thinking you can buy, Ask them if, if you can have a call with them and go over what the advantages or disadvantages are. I know I've loaned Nooks to people so they can try it out at home and, you know, they give it back to me two months later. So that's always a good way to start before you actually commit the resources. Great. How about you, Kevin? So decide how much of your time you want to commit to it. Um, in my case, I'm, uh, you know, hard on myself, I guess, and I've run a bunch of production stuff through my home lab. So I'm willing to get up in the middle of supper if something's broken and go fix it. But if you're not willing to do that, keep it simple. But more importantly, have a plan, run it like a project, right? As far as building out your home lab. Yeah. Nico. Uh, I would say have fun with it. If it becomes a second job, maybe you have to reevaluate what you've bought or what you're doing. Um, because, you know, we're supposed to enjoy what we're doing. So if you find it, it's becoming a chore. If you bought a bunch of hardware and you're having trouble putting it together, or if you got a little too complicated, you know, just maybe step back and, you know, make sure you're just, you know, you're not treating it like a second job, like just have fun with it and just learn from it. Yeah. Uh, Bill. Yeah. You know, I think it, 
for me, it comes down to really identify what you want to do. It's, it's not even just the plan, but what's your goal for it? Are you trying to be a better uh, TAM? Are you trying to be more technical? Are you trying to replicate a customer environment? Whatever that is, right? And stick to that plan as much as you can. Um, I know for me, I'm not necessarily looking to replicate customer environments. I'm just not, right? So the scale of what I need to do is like this, but I know I'm interested in a handful of things. And so that's how I'm using that to shape what my lab looks like. So really understand what you are truly trying to get out of it and then try and stick to it. Good. Dale. Number one, embrace nesting from the beginning. It's going to make your lab much more functional. I said it before, I'll say it again. Next, embrace the learning from the beginning. We've talked a lot about VMware learning. There's other learning that you need to understand or maybe take, take part in. You know, when your customer talks about AD-based DNS, do you know how to set that up? When your customer talks about a specific Linux distribution, do you know how to operate within that Linux distribution? The home lab is the platform for implementing all those different things so that you can learn them. It's really about becoming a lifelong learner is really what this is about. Steve Tilkins, take us home, buddy. Um, I guess I'll say, uh, I'll agree with something Dale said earlier around the state of my lab is that it's very cyclical, right? Sometimes it's like pristine and I've got everything documented and I've got everything working perfectly. And other times, most times it's a complete disaster, right? And I'm rebuilding things all the time. Um, so I would say just have fun with it, right? Keep it, I enjoy it because I, I love technology. So I almost get excited when I'm like, okay, I don't really have a whole lot of customer stuff going on right now. I'm just going to go play around in my lab and do something new, implement some other third-party product. Maybe it's not even a VMware thing. Um, but just keep in mind that your home lab will never be quote unquote done. You're never finished. You know, you're never going to get to, once my home lab is finished, I can do these things. It's, it's always in a state of, flux i think somebody said earlier right so that's all i got uh other than feel free to reach out i think most of us are out on tw uh, twitter or you know linkedin or whatever so uh, I'm, I'm sure it's pretty easy to find any of us if you just google us so that's it great uh so uh wrapping this up we'll have some resources on on the tam lab site uh, some links that you can go to, especially for kind of, you know, how to get started and some of the more technical questions. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll compile those, uh, those, those blog links from our, our panelists here, along with their Twitter handles. So, you know, it's a, it's a great way to, you know, kind of increase your knowledge and, and, and reach out to people and, and make those connections as you are, are looking at your, your home lab journey. So I'm going to turn it back to Steve and uh, to wrap things up. Yeah, I don't have anything else. So uh, I know we're a little past the hour here, but uh, this has been really fun. So thanks everyone for joining on the panel and everyone for uh, putting questions in the chat. Thanks for moderating, Jody. This has been awesome. So I guess with that, I'll let everybody go. Hey, everybody stay safe. All right. Thank you, Jody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.